I want to talk about um, what attracts God to your life. You know, um, in, the, in the New Testament, it's actually in the book of Acts, um, Peter gets called to Cornelius' house and he doesn't even think that Cornelius, that the Gentiles are even allowed to get the gospel. So he's coming from a mindset that, you know, these Gentiles, they're not going to get saved. It's only for the Jews. But he gets into Cornelius' house and then as he starts to speak, I mean, God doesn't even wait for him to finish his sermon and the Holy Spirit is, falls upon this incredible group of, of friends of Cornelius and um, they receive the Holy Spirit the same way that the disciples of Jesus got it. And Peter opens his mouth and he just makes the statement and he says, I, of a truth I perceive that God's no respecter of persons. All right? God's got no favorites. He's got no like, you know, special people that, you know, um, that, oh, I'm, I'm, I love this person, but I don't like that. You know, he doesn't have favorites in terms of respecting people, in terms of who they are. But he does respect certain qualities that we develop and certain qualities that we display. And I would like to learn whatever qualities are that attract God into my life. I want God to be a part of my life. And so I want to learn some of these qualities. And so if I do that, I'm praying that God will participate more in my future. So these are just a few uh, gems in the scriptures. And I'm going to end with what I consider the most you know, powerful and the most strongest thing that I believe attracts God into your life. And then we'll turn it around as we come to the end here. But um, the first thing I want to say is that God's not a respecter of, of, uh, of persons, but he does respect faith. The Bible says that anybody who comes to God, it says Hebrews 11 verse 6, and I know they're going to try and put up some of the scriptures, but there, some of them are very short it says these words, Hebrews 11, verse 6. It says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So faith is something that God respects. It's, it's something that, you know, whenever God sees faith, um, it, it attracts God. God is attracted to people who trust him. Whenever whether it's Daniel in the lion's den or whatever, when, a, when, when you see a person fully put their faith in God, then, you know, it's like you'll see God get involved. It's an amazing factor. But faith is a key. The opposite is, is, you know, doubt. I've heard the statement, doubt is the dark room in which the devil develops his negatives. All right? If those of us before we had the digital prints, you know, digital uh, cameras and everything else, you used to have to go into a dark room and develop your, your photos. But, you know, doubt is that place where the enemy develops negatives. He just, he develops a whole negative mindset. If you, doubt is the opposite of faith. And you'll see in the New Testament, you know, Jesus confronts, there's two major people, neither of them are Jews, that Jesus actually, you know, commends their faith, all right? One of them is, is uh, the centurion, all right, who comes to he doesn't even come to Jesus, he sends the delegation to Jesus and then um, you know he says, Can you come and heal my servant? And then when Jesus is actually on his way, he sends another delegation, he says, Hey, you don't even have to come, just speak the word and my servant will be healed. He says, I'm a man under authority. Jesus turns to his disciples, he says, My goodness, he says, I have not found this type of faith in the whole of Israel. All right? A centurion. And you know, um, Jesus actually commends him, but it's interesting that Jesus said, I have not found, which means he's looking. He's looking for faith. He's looking throughout our hearts to find, are you going to trust him? You always have a decision in everything that you do. Are you going to trust God or are you going to trust something else? And that's always going to come down to it, whether you're going to put your faith in him and hold on to him with everything you have. And I'll tell you, the Bible says, he who trusts in the Lord will not be put to shame. He will not be disappointed. Hold on to God. And you know, like the people who like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they said, we don't care. If we perish, we perish. He says, but we will not, we will not bow to the king. We will not bow to his will. We will trust God, even if we die. And it's that, if you have that attitude, the Bible's, you know, is very clear how God comes through 
I heard a preacher, I heard of a preacher who said these words. He said, "If you are prepared to stand forever, you won't have to wait long." It's very, very profound. Think about that. If you prepare to stand forever, you won't have to wait long. The second person is a Syrophoenician woman who comes to Jesus on behalf of her daughter. And her daughter's demon possessed. And this is a woman who's not part of the promises of God. She's not a child of Israel. And, you know, and Jesus kind of pushes her away. It's like, you know, listen, you know, don't, I can't take the children's bread, which is the Jews, the Jews bread and give it to a, a Gentile is basically what Jesus, but Jesus says, I can't take the children's bread and give it to the little dogs. He actually is quite, you know, off putting to this woman. But doesn't doesn't stop her at all, she says. But Jesus, even the little dogs eat the scraps from under the under the master's table. Jesus said, "Oh, great is your faith! Great is your faith! Go, your child is healed." And the child was healed instantly. And Jesus commends faith. When you put your faith in Him, you are going to see God come through for you. And so. The, the second area uh, that attracts God, right? So faith attracts God. And if you, whatever situation you're facing, that you put your faith in Him, He instantly is looking for it, and He, he will show Himself to you. He will come on your behalf. The second thing is that it's contained in these stories. Persistence is a tremendous thing that, that God respects. You know, I, I, I commended Hunter there just saying, Hunter, thank you for finishing. Thank you for persevering. Because it's not just, you know, a seminar or a weekend program. I mean, it's two full years of week after week coming into studies and classes. It's 160 hours or sessions of teaching and all the homework and the tests and the exams. And I mean, it's, it is long obedience in the same direction. And God respects persistence and perseverance. He, he respects it. We read that scripture in Hebrews 11:6. It says that, you know, without faith it's impossible to please God. He who comes to God believe that He is, and He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. If you diligently seek Him, if you persist after Him. Um, there's a wonderful story of blind Bartimaeus that's found in Mark 10. And um, it says, I'll just read it from Mark 10, verse 46. Now they came to Jericho, and... Uh, Jesus is walking along and he, came, he comes into Jericho. As he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Now, Jesus then heals blind Bartimaeus, and, and, and it's an amazing story. But, you know, people will say, no, just keep quiet, keep quiet like this. But he just persisted. He just, and there's something about a tenacity that God respects. Then you just say, you know, many people say, oh, I just prayed. That was it. I recently just did a documentary. I flew to Minneapolis to document a person who was almost a quarter of a million dollars in debt compared to in today's terms. A number of years ago, and he literally had twenty-eight dollars left in, the, in his bank account. Him and his wife, and their lives were shattered. They looked like they were going into bankruptcy. That there was everything was gone. And he was reading the scriptures one night, and he came across Malachi three ten. It says, "Bring the tithe into the storehouse and test me." God says, "I will open the windows of heaven, pour out a blessing that you won't be able to contain." He ran through to his wife. Now he came from a Lutheran background. He didn't, you know, he wasn't raised in a full gospel type of, you know, name it and claim it, confess. He just, that scripture just jumped off the pages at him. And he ran back to his wife. He said, honey, look at this. Look at this. He says, let's take the last $28 we have left and let's give it to the church tomorrow. His wife's like, you've gone completely crazy. Jason, their son needs shoes and whatever. He said, well, well, you know, we're this far down the hole. Let's, you know, let's just trust God. Look at the scripture. They took the last $28 and they gave it into the church. And I said to him, did money just start coming in? He said, no. Wisdom came. 
He said, suddenly I knew what job to go after, what thing to do, what, what, how to do his business. He knew, he says, wisdom came. And from that point onwards, he took that scripture and he put it on his bathroom mirror. He took it and put it in the refrigerator. He put it in the visor of his car. He confessed it at least uh, 20 to 30 times, sometimes more than that, every single day. And every single need began to get met every month. And it, for, it took him about three years and he says, then the windows of heaven began to open. And it took them 15 years. They paid back the quarter of a million dollars of debt. And this guy's one of the greatest givers into the kingdom of God. And that scripture became a revelation to him. But he didn't just give up after one day or five days. He, he persevered. He held on. He spoke it. He, he, he went after it. And God manifested. Amen? Persistence is very, very, very powerful. God respects a seeking, knocking, and asking heart. Matthew 7, verse 7 and 8, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, it will be opened to you. Everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. Him who knocks, it will be opened. And it's a, it's a continuous type of thing. It's not just knock. Oh, okay, God's not here. No, it's a knock, and a knock, and a knock, and it's a perseverance. God respects it. It gets his attention. When Bartimaeus kept on crying, it says suddenly Jesus stood still, got his attention. It attracted Jesus, says, bring that person here. Perseverance attracts God into your life. Amen? Third thing, humility. Humility is an attractor. <laughs> All right? That's why the Bible says, humble yourself, you know, and God will raise you up. All right? Um, James 4 6 says, God resists the proud but he gives grace to the humble. So if you have a proud heart and you come and you just have a demanding type of thing and you just have a sort of entitlement mentality before God, he will resist you. I don't want anything that makes God resist me, all right? But he says he will give grace to the humble. As soon as God sees a humility in your heart, he will be attracted to you. Humility attracts God into your life. Um, I, I was part of a church in Virginia um, connected to uh, your, your, your grandfather. And a guy called John Robert Topping was the past senior pastor of that church. church uh, it was Whole Word Fellowship Church in Northern Virginia. Uh, he's gone on to be with the Lord. But he had a number, I think eight different occasions where he physically saw Jesus. He actually had encounters where he had an encounter with the Lord. A very holy man. He actually helped lay my foundation spiritually. And he once described, and I remember him sharing this, and he said, he said, the first time I ever had an encounter and I actually saw the Lord. He said, you know, you think, well, oh, Jesus, you think of his glory, his majesty, his, you know, his fiery eyes or whatever like that. He said, none of that was what, none of that's what, what struck me. He said, when I looked into the eyes of Jesus, he said, I looked into the eyes of pure meekness. He says his humility and the meekness in the eyes of Jesus, he says it turned the inside of me into corruption. It just caused me to realize how much pride I had in my life. And he says, I, I looked into those eyes and I just saw utter meekness and utter humility. That's the heart of God. And when we humble ourselves, it attracts God. He resists the pride. He gives grace to the humble. And this in Psalm 51 verse 17, when David sinned against God with Bathsheba, he prays this incredible prayer, Psalm 51 verse 17, and he says these words, he says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. A broken heart, a contrite spirit, a humility of heart attracts God into your life. Amen? How many of you want to get God in your life? <laughs> All right, these are, going to, these are some principles. If you, if, you, if, you, if you understand them, you will have more of God than, you, than you've ever had before. All right, the next one is very, um, it, it's, it's, it's not just, a, it's obedience, but it's sacrificial obedience. There's, a, there's a, an incredible thing, you know, the principle of sacrifice in the Old Testament. Um, God was teaching humans something. 
that when you sacrifice something, when you take something that's valuable to you and you and you sacrifice it to God, in the Old Testament maybe it was, you know, uh, an animal or whatever it was, it was, but the principle that God was teaching was that they would take something very dear and precious and they would offer it and put it before God as a sacrifice to Him. I was just reading about Solomon, you know, he sacrificed a thousand uh, animals to 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 God when um, you know just before God visited him. In fact, it says he made the sacrifice, and then God came and said, "Solomon, what do you want? Anything? I'll give you anything you want." You read what happened right before he sacrificed a thousand animals. It wasn't just one, a thousand. And it wasn't the fact. Yes, we talk about you know Peter would go crazy and all the rest of it, but. I'm just talking about the, the act of wanting to sacrifice before God something that is incredibly valuable. And something about that, when Abraham offered Isaac, he took his son that all the promises that God had made him for his entire future were in this one child. He wasn't a, one of 15 sons. He only had one. And it was the son of the old, his old age, and it was his wife had far gone past to having children when she had Isaac. This was a miracle child. And everything God had promised was in this child. And then God, when the kid's about 13 years old, God says, now take the son to Mount Moriah and sacrifice him to me. And we, we've got no idea to even understand that story. We don't even understand what it meant for him to take that kid. And I can't imagine the tears in the eyes of Abraham, the tears in the eyes of Isaac as he bound up his kid, put him on the altar took out a knife and was willing to sacrifice him. He was willing to give to God the most precious, the dearest, the most wonderful gift that he ever had in his life. But he was willing to give it back to God. God said, stop. Then God swore an oath. It's the Abraham promise. I'll bless you. I'll multiply you. Your, your seed will possess the gate of his enemies. Every nation on the earth will be blessed. And it was a promise to the church. That eternal salvation would come because Abraham was willing to offer his son. God says, I'll offer my son. I'll sacrifice him. And so that sacrifice is an incredible, incredible. It's, it, it's something about it. When you do something sacrificial, we were visiting in Israel. I'm not sure if it was the time that you guys were there. Um, we went to the, uh, the, the Aliyah Return Center where they, uh, Jews come back from all the nations of the earth and they provide a place for them to to be um, you know, rehabilitated and to be brought into the life of Israel. And these Jews are coming from the Soviet Union, former Soviet Union, and from all the Eastern Bloc and many countries of the world. And um, we're at the center, and we were looking at the lives of these Jews, and we're seeing prophecy fulfilled. And, you know, and people were just began to be moved and touched. And my right-hand person is a guy called Adish. Him and his wife, Deirdre, were there. And... People began to just take off their wedding rings and began to just sacrifice it and just say, God, I'm giving this into this work. I want to sow, I want to sow into this what you're doing in the nations and what you're doing to bring your people back. And my friend Adish, he went up and him and his wife took their wedding rings and put it in. And then he told me afterwards, he said, um, that wasn't just any wedding ring, he says, he said, I spent three years paying for that ring. He says it was a $10,000 ring. And I just remember, and, and God has phenomenally blessed this brother. Now, since even he did that. But I saw that he was willing to take something incredibly precious and he was willing to give it to God and sow it into the kingdom of God and sow it into God's purposes. When you give something sacrificially to God, it attracts God. It will release things. That sacrifice of Abraham offering Isaac released salvation to the world. It was the greatest act of obedience and sacrifice next to Jesus on the cross that's ever been given. Amen? Are you getting a few things out of this? I'm just got a few more here. We're going to just cover them and then we'll close up here. Um, this one's pretty obvious. Um, right priorities. Right priorities attract God. And that's why Jesus says these words, seek first the kingdom of God and seek his righteousness and everything else will be added to you. The moment you put your priorities in order and you put God first, everything else in order after that, as soon as that happens, God says, everything's yours. Get your priorities right and God will step in 
and He will help you with everything else. Are you with me, church? Simple one, but it's important. All right? And it's important as well. You know, the principle in the Old Testament is when people gave things to God and when they put God first, God always required the first and the best. Anybody who gives God the last things, a lot of people with their tithes, and they, oh God, if there's anything left over, I'll give it to you. The way and what this brother in Minneapolis learned, he said, the moment he got any resources, he took the first and the best. When people had crops in the Old Testament, they took the, the best and the first. The first fruits, the first ripe grapes, the first wine, the first oil, the first of, and the best. God, don't give God the leftovers and don't give him the drakes. Always give him the first and the best. And that's the right priority that God respects. Amen? Generosity attracts God. All right? We just got one or two more here. Generosity attracts God. Um, Mark did a great job of sharing some of those uh, scriptures, but Proverbs 11:25, "The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself." It's an interesting thing. Jesus tells a story. It's in Mark chapter 12, verse 41, um, and we all know it as the widow's mite. And I'll just read the scripture, Mark 12, verse 41. Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put the money in the treasury. It doesn't say he saw, you know, um, you know, he just watched them giving. He's watching how you put the money in the treasury. People say, well, I just put it in. Oh, it's just my obligation. Oh, it's a tithe. I've got to give it to God. No, he watches how you do it. He watches a cheerful heart. He watches it giving it from your heart, from you as a sacrifice to him. When, when you give with the right heart, God watches how you give, not just what you give. But he also watches what he gives, even though she's giving the smallest amount. It says, And many who were rich put in much. And one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which makes a quadrants. Now, it's, a lo- it's very small, pennies. So he called his disciples to himself. All right? Remember, we're talking about what attracts God to you. As soon as Jesus saw that woman and saw her, you know, two little mites, tiny thing, this poor widow woman, she drops these two coins in. And Jesus is like, wow. He calls his disciples and says, hey, this, this woman just got my attention. All right? I'm attracted to this woman. I'm attracted to what she just did. And this is what he says. He called his disciples and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all of those who've given to the treasury. For they all put in out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all that she has, her whole livelihood. Sacrificial obedience, sacrificial offering. She gave everything. And it attracted God into her life. Believe you me, I bet you she had her needs met. Because God will not despise a person who does that. Amen? Finally here, well, this is before we get to the, 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 the cream of the crop here. Um, the story that we are told you about um, um, Peter's at the house of Cornelius. All right? God's got the entire Gentile world. All right? Remember, the gospel's only gone to the Jews up until this point. God's looking through the whole Gentile world to see who do I... Who do I give the gospel to first? Who's going to be the very first Gentile to be one into the kingdom of God? And he finds this, this centurion. He finds this guy, Cornelius. And an angel comes to him and says to him, Hey, Cornelius, he says, um, your, your giving, your alms, and your prayers have come up as a memorial before God. Here's a guy who doesn't even know God doesn't even know who God is. He, he knows there's a God there, but he doesn't even know how to worship. He doesn't know what to worship or in what way to worship. But he daily is praying to this God he doesn't know. And he gives into the good works and he gives alms into, you know, into helping people. And it, it so got the attention of heaven. It says that it rose up as a memorial before God. And when God looked at the whole world, he says, that guy's going to be the first person to get the gospel. And, and the angel said, your arms and your, and your prayers have come up before God and God's giving the gospel to you. And it's an incredible, incredible story, but God respects that. You know, I, we, we often don't understand the power of, of what we give and how we give it. But 
I remember the, uh, just hearing the story of a West Virginian couple. It was a husband and wife. She played the piano, and he led the choir. All right, and every month they would just they would just give um, ten dollars to World Missions, just ten bucks. It was a faithful ten dollars, but every month they would sow ten ten dollars to World Missions. Well, he went away. He 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 passed away, and um, a financial planner sat down with her and said, "Look, you know, we, we, we're going to have to cut back your budget. We're going to have to make sure." And and okay, you've got your ties. She says, "What's this ten dollars? We're going to have to get rid of that." He said, well, we just give that every month to World Missions. And, he, and so he said, no, we're going to have to stop that. That's not going to be, no, there's no budget for that. So she stopped giving it. But a month later, the pastor was sleeping at about midnight. And the phone rings. And it's this woman on the phone. And it's the lady. She says, Pastor, I just need to come over to your house right now. She says, he says, it's midnight. Why do you want to come over to my house? He says, I need to give my $10. I need to give my $10. He said, I, I don't understand. So she comes over. He comes down in, his, in, his, in his, you know, his bathrobe. And he's basically like, what is this woman thinking? You know, come over at midnight in the night. And he opens the door. And he, she's got the $10 there. She says, I had a dream tonight. And she said, and and." In the dream, God called me up into heaven, and she said, I saw my husband. And he was leading this massive choir from all over the world, from nations and different tribes and languages and people. And my husband was leading that choir. And she said, Lord, what's he doing? And the Lord said, those are all the people that were reached with the $10 that you gave every month. She said, here it is. You don't understand the power of your giving and what it does and how it touches nations and how it impacts the world. But what you do now is going to affect your eternity. And so that touches the heart of God and I believe it's going to give great reward. So I'm going to give you now the, the most important thing that will get God's attention. And it's what I call loyalty of heart. A loyal heart is the most powerful thing that will attract God to your life and will keep God engaged in what you're doing and in your future. And I want us to just put up the scripture if you can. It comes from um, 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. And there's a king here who has been very faithful to God. And then at the end of, the li of his life, he decides he's going to trust in another army instead of trusting in God. So he just makes a decision I'm not going to trust in God. And, and God sends a prophet to him. And this is the important things of long obedience in the same direction. Of not just starting and being trusting God. Because sometimes we trust in God. In fact, a preacher was recently asked. There's a very famous preacher. I won't mention his name. But they asked him, you know, how much money is too much? How much money is too much? His answer was profound. He said, any amount of money that causes you to move your trust away from God to the money, that's too much. Whenever you move your trust away from God to the money, that's too much for you. So if you can have millions of dollars and, and just doesn't even touch you, but your faith is 100% still in God, then you're okay. But if you begin to trust in the resources, then you've made a mistake. You're in, a, you're in trouble. This guy began to trust in this army. And... God sends a prophet to him, and he just rebukes him. Because this guy had won many battles before trusting in God, but now he starts trust, trust, trusting in, 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 in other things. And God says to these words to him, he says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Now, if God's eyes are going to and fro throughout the whole earth, if there's any quality in a human life that God is longing for, that he's looking for, it says his eyes are searching for any person who has this quality of loyalty of heart, that is how, that's how valuable this commodity is and how seldom he finds it. We're so, we're so easily moved away from our covenants. We did a marriage yesterday and, you know, and, 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 you know we have to understand that, that, 
God is a covenant-keeping God. God's a God of loyalty. God is a God that loyalty is a very high value to him. And this word loyal means it's actually the word shalem. All right, the word shalem is what loyal, that's what the word is. It means, listen to the definitions, perfect, complete, of keeping covenant relation, of covenant peace, um, safe, peaceful, perfect, whole, full of peace. Um, it's mentioned 27 times in the scriptures, and the meanings carry with them the idea of serving God with a sincere heart, a covenant-keeping heart, a single-minded and loyal devotion. It conveys the clear idea of serving God with all of your heart, with full love, with full loyalty, and full integrity. A few years ago, I was sitting in, 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 in my office in California, and phone rang, and, um, and my assistant came through, and she said, Oh, she said, Reinhard Bonk is on the phone for you. I hadn't spoken to Reinhard for a number of years, and here he is calling my office. And I'm like, and she's like, just let me talk to him first. I want to hear his voice. So she gets on the phone, you know, she says, it's one of those, you know, what are your starstruck moments. And so she finally puts him through to me, and, um, you know, and it was just like I was back with him because I traveled with him for three and a half years. He's a spiritual father to me. And it's just instantly that God puts that, that connection back. Certain people are like that. And, and he says, hey, hello, Baron. And he's like, you know, and, he's, and, he, and, and he then says something to me. He says, you know, he says, somebody has come to me and asked me to recommend um, a ministry that they can sow some funds into. And he says, I, I would like to recommend your ministry. The person wants to give $50,000. Now, you may think 50000 is a lot, but we go through that in about a week in our ministry. But the fact that 18 or 20 or 25 years after I was with Reinhard, when I was with Reinhard, I served him with everything in my being. I served him with a whole heart. It didn't make a difference what day or night. I never kept it kept a time clock. I didn't do whatever had to be done, whether it was through the night editing, ministry, whatever had to be done. I just gave everything. I loved his ministry, served his ministry with all in my being. And now, this 25 years later, Reinhard calls and he says, God's going to reward what you serve, the way you serve me. I knew it was a reward for loyalty. I knew it was a reward that after all those years that, that God was going to reward that. It doesn't make a difference how long it takes. God will reward loyalty. Loyalty of heart. God's eyes will show himself strong when you have a loyal heart. And so, um, it, to me, it was just an incredible, incredible uh, moment. And um, I just was so touched because, because I was loyal to Reinhard. I now have a team of over 20 people that uh, serve the vision of ISOM around the world. And I have incredible loyal people. I have people that work 12-hour days. They don't even keep track of time. I have people who give everything they have and sow and love and, and serve with that singleness of heart. And God's looking for that. And if you want to start, you start in your local church. You start with what God puts before you and serve it with all your heart and do with the right spirit. Learn loyalty in every area of your life. And God will come through for you in an incredible, incredible way. Um, there's just uh, one or two more things about this loyalty. This, there's this proverb in Proverbs 19 verse 22. This is the New Living Translation. So it, may not be, it won't be in the same in the King James. But it's a wonderful way that New Living Translation just simply says these words. Loyalty makes a person attractive. So ladies, if you really want to be attractive, <laughs> all right, loyalty makes people attractive. There's something about loyalty that's infectious. Um, and it's not just loyalty to God, all right? Loyalty in your relationships is very powerful to God. If you think of the, of the lady Ruth in the Bible, her, you know, she's not one of the children. Again, not a child of God, not a child of Israel. She's a Moabite. She's from a different, you know, background and people group and you know normally they didn't partake in the promises of God but this lady Ruth you know she's she had a loyalty to her mother-in-law very unusual thing all right 
She had a loyalty to Naomi. And, you know, she has nothing but tragedy. You can really tell loyalty when everything goes wrong. Then you'll see who, whether people are loyal or not. All right? So you look at this story of, of you know, um, that Ruth and her, and, 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 you know, she marries to, to one of the children of Israel. And Naomi and her husband, Elimelech, they go down to Moab and they take their two sons. Both sons get married. All right? Now tragedy strikes. In seven years, the father dies. Then the one son dies. And the second son dies. We're talking triple tragedy in seven years. This is, this is young, young families. And so now Naomi is left with the two daughter-in-laws. And Naomi says, just look, I've got no, no more kids in my womb. You just go back to your people. And, you know, the one just says, oh, cheers, goodbye, I'm gone. And so she takes off. And then it says that she tries to get rid of Ruth. And this is what Ruth says. Listen to loyalty in relationship. Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. Wow. That's loyalty of heart. If you look at the story of Ruth, God sees that, that loyalty and he takes that woman and she ends up marrying Boaz and she becomes the great, great grandmother of King David. And God puts her into the lineage of Christ and puts her into the lineage of the, of the Messiah. God takes that woman out of absolute poverty and out of destruction and he weaves her into the eternal plan of heaven. And God rewards that woman's loyalty to her mother-in-law. Because the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the whole earth. They're looking for this one quality. David and Jonathan, we read this in 1 Samuel 20. At last, Jonathan said to David, this incredible friendship, this incredible loyalty. Listen to the words that he says. Go in peace. Jonathan says this to David. Go in peace, David, for we have sworn loyalty to each other in the Lord's name. The Lord is the witness of a bond between us and our children forever. And that becomes the basis of this incredible God friendship that, 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 that touched the world. A few years ago, we were in Japan. We um, I was going to be back there in September. And we were doing a missions trip doing skateboarding. And we took a world, the world champion skateboarder and we did these, these incredible skating events and then we preached the gospel to the Japanese and we were coming out of one of the Tokyo stations and there is a statue of a dog all right and it's a, and it's and, and it's like it's it's the name of the dog was um Hachiko um and we were like well, I just wanted to what's the what's behind this dog and so I'll just read you the story of this dog a bronze statue can be found outside one of Tokyo's main metro stations. This dog used to meet his master at a certain spot every evening when he came back from work. His master was a teacher and professor by the name of Professor Yuno and a professor of agriculture at the University of Tokyo. One day at work, Professor Yuno had a brain hemorrhage and he died. He never returned home after that. But the dog for the next nine years would appear at the same spot every night at the same time that that train would arrive and the people of Japan have actually erected three bronze statues of Hachiko and the story of the dog's loyalty has inspired two movies a dog loyalty makes you attractive a dog for nine years every evening at that time was waiting for its master. Something about that that's just amazing. We see Jesus comparing the loyalty of a shepherd with the Lord, loyalty of a hireling. And you see this comparison in John chapter 10. The shepherd cares, is willing to fight, is willing to protect, to love, to even die for the sheep. The hireling doesn't care, but runs from trouble, is only interested in themselves. 
We must develop the heart of a shepherd. A loyal heart is a vulnerable heart. It can be wounded because you keep it tender. Because you always believe. You never quit. You never stop caring. You never stop loving. You never stop trying. When God sees that kind of heart and he's looking for it, then he will move into action on your behalf. So we have eight things. And there's actually many more than that. We're not going to go into any more than that. But we have a loyal heart. We have faith. We have persistence. We have humility, obedience and sacrifice, right priorities, generosity, prayer and giving. Of course, the loyal heart. If you have these qualities, God will run. He will, he will run to you. But I'm going to turn this around and with a closing story. That I used to do springboard diving. I used to do, and I, I love watching it in the Olympics and these, these world championships that they have. Of, it's an incredible sport. And um, platform diving is even more difficult. I didn't do the platform because I didn't want to die. <laughs> but, you know, um, I want to close with this because I want you just to think about this. Not only does these qualities attract God to your life, but really, these are the qualities that attract us to Jesus. Because when we look at his life, all of these things are there. And actually, those are the things that draw us to him. When we see the cross, when we see the sacrifice, when we see his faith, when we see his obedience and his willingness to die, we see his generosity, when we see that he gave everything, when we see that he selflessly live to help other people. We see all of these qualities. We see humility. We see right priorities. We see his prayers, his giving, his, his faith. All of these qualities, we see, that's what we see in Jesus that attracts us to him. It's like, God, I want to be like him. I want to know him. I want to, that's what I should, I want to live like that. So maybe just read this story as we close. It's called The Cross. 1967, while I was still, this is a guy writing a story, he says, in 1967, while I was taking a class of, in photography at the University of Cincinnati, I became acquainted with a young man named Charles Murray, who was also a student at the school and training for the Summer Olympics of 1968 as a high diver. Charles was very patient with me as I would speak to him for hours about Jesus Christ and how he'd saved me. Charles was not raised in a home that attended any kind of church, so all that I had to tell him was a fascination to him. He even began to ask questions about the forgiveness of sin. Finally, the day came that I had put a question to him. I asked if he had realized his own need of, of a Redeemer and if he was ready to trust Christ as his own Savior. I saw his countenance fall and the guilt on his face, but his reply was a strong no. In the days that followed, he was quiet, and often I felt like he was avoiding me until I got a phone call from him. He wanted to know where to look in the New Testament for some verses I had given him about salvation. I gave him the references to several passages and asked if I could meet with him. He declined my offer and thanked me for the scripture. I could tell that he was greatly troubled, but I did not know where he was or how to help him. Because he was training for the Olympic Games, Charles had special privileges at the university pool facilities. Sometime between 10.30 and 11 p.m. that evening, he decided to go and swim and practice a few dives. It was a clear night in October, and the moon was big and bright. The university pool was housed under a ceiling of glass, of glass panes, so the moon shone brightly across the top wall of the pool area. Charles climbed to the highest platform to take his first dive. At that moment, the Spirit of God began to convict him of his sins. All the scriptures that I had read him, all the occasions of witnessing to him about Christ flooded his mind. He stood on the platform backwards to make his dive. He spread his arms to gather his balance, looked up at the wall, and he saw his own shadow caused by the light of the moon. His shadow was in the shape of a cross. He could bear the burden of sin no longer. His heart broke and he sat down on the platform and he asked God to forgive him and save him. He trusted Jesus some 30 feet in the air. Suddenly, the lights in the pool area came on. The attendant had come in to check the pool. As Charles looked down from his platform, 
he saw an empty pool that had been drained for repairs. Us. That's what saved him. Not just spiritually, but literally. And I know that when we see the cross, we see all these qualities. And I just, I just, my heart's just challenging all of us. God, give us a loyal heart. Give us these qualities that attract you into our lives so that we can be used by God, that God can be a part of our future, be a part of our families, be a part of our, our everything that we do. He is attracted to all of these areas, but most of all, a loyal heart. God searches for that. So let's close our eyes as we close the service. I just want to ask this question that, you know, there's all kinds of people, and I don't know, most of you, I don't know. Um, I don't even know how you got into church today, but it's no accident that you're here. God brought you. And I, I want to give everybody an opportunity today. If you have not fully given your life to Jesus Christ, and you know today you need to, you need to make that decision to make Jesus fully Lord of your life. Or if you also have been once with him, but you have moved away from him, and you, today you need to come back to him. God is knocking at the door of your heart, and he's asking that you will allow him to come forgive you, to manifest his love to you, to manifest his forgiveness to you. Will you humble yourself today enough to invite him, to ask him to be the Lord and Savior of your life? And if you will do that, Jesus will come into your heart. He will change your future. And he will forgive everything you've ever done. He will wash you clean. And he will give you a new hope. And he will give you a new lease on life by his Holy Spirit. So I'm going to ask if there's anybody. I'm not going to embarrass anybody. This is between you and God. And I'm only going to ask you to raise your hand and put it right back down again. And I'm going to pray with you as a, as a group. But is there anybody here that you need to make that decision today? If you could just raise up your hand and put it right back down again. God sees your hearts. This is between you and God. If you need to come back, I see your hand. Anybody else that needs to make that decision? I see your hand. Anybody else? It's between you and him. The presence of God is really wonderful. Jesus' presence is in this place. Jesus is here. He's knocking at the door of your heart and saying, Will you let me in? Will you invite me to be the Savior of your life? Will you make me the Lord of your life? Anybody else that needs to make that decision, I don't care how young or old you are. I was 12 years old when I gave my heart to Jesus. It doesn't make a difference. But if you need to make that decision, just raise up your hand and put it right back down again. I see your hand. God bless you. I've got that. Anybody else? Many times we think we, we're going to go to heaven because we're good enough, but as... Pastor Phil said earlier, you can never be good enough. It's only the blood of Jesus that forgives you. When you stand before God, God says, why should I let you into heaven? You better not say, because God, I lived a good life. Or you went to church. Or that you, you know, your parents were good, good parents. Or, or you did, gave money to the poor. It doesn't make any difference. There's only one qualification. It's whether you have fully given your heart and life to Jesus Christ. There is nothing else that will make you right before God. When you've accepted Jesus, the Father says to you, why should I let you in? You say, God, because Jesus paid the price for every sin I ever did. His blood washed me, and his blood is for the, my forgiveness. And I can stand righteous because of what Jesus did for me. There's no other answers that gets you into heaven. And if you've not put your full trust and your full faith in that blood that Jesus shed on the cross for you, then you are not going to make it to heaven. I just guarantee that to you now. But you can make that decision today and you can change your destiny. If you need to make Jesus Lord of your life and there's an urgency and I'm, you think I'm going to have a lot of chances to do this, but let me tell you, there are a few opportunities. You don't know what tomorrow brings. You don't know what the future brings. Today is the day of salvation. The Bible says today is the day. If God has presented it to you and you understand it, today is the day to seize it and take a hold of it and ask him to be Lord like I say, I'm not embarrassing anybody. This is between you and God. But if you need to make that decision, and the angels are watching and God is watching, he's looking in through the hearts of everybody here. Anybody else that needs to come back to him or needs to make that 
decision for the first time, just raise your hand and put it right back down again. Like I say, I'm not embarrassing anybody. Anybody else, just raise up your hand. All right, we're going to pray this prayer together. Let's all pray it in agreement with those that raise their hands. Say, Dear Heavenly Father. Say it again. Dear Heavenly Father. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son. That you sent him to the earth. He was born as a child. He grew up to be a man. And he went to a cross. And he died a horrible death for my sins, for my salvation. You sacrificed him. Your most precious, your best. Your only son. You sacrificed him. For my sins. For my forgiveness. I believe. He rose from the dead. And that he's alive right now. Dear Jesus. I ask you now. Wash my past. Forgive my sins. Come into my heart. Be my Lord. And be my savior. I give my future. Into your hands. And I ask you Jesus. Help me to serve you. With a loyal heart. All the days of my life. Thank you now. That I'm a child of God. In Jesus name. Everybody put your hand over your hearts just for a moment. God's presence is in this place. Father, I pray for an, a healing anointing into the hearts of your people. I pray that you would physically touch and heal your people. Holy Spirit, move in the midst. Lord, there are many faithful hearts in this church, and I ask you, God, to bless them. I ask you to, to touch them. I ask you to heal physical bodies. I speak to pain. I speak to uh, every single sickness and every single uh, disease. I curse it in the name of Jesus I ask father your healing power father Holy Spirit move and touch and heal heal broken hearts heal damaged minds heal physical bodies Lord in the name of Jesus let your healing manifest right now thank you for your presence thank you for your power in Jesus name